Evan, you're muted. Uh. Good afternoon, comrades, and uh, welcome to this afternoon session of um, Historical Materialism 2020, Survival Pending Revolution. Um, it's a real pleasure to welcome everyone uh, to this panel. Um, I'd just like to say how amazing the conference has been so far with the talks like Ashley Bora and Holly Lewis's last night on intersectional Marxism, David McNally's, uh, the panel on David McNally's Blood and Money, uh, sort of representing hugely important interventions in ongoing questions of political struggle. And a huge thank you to the organizers who are toiling away at the back of, uh, back of house. Uh, without further ado, welcome to the third year of Leftovers Live at Historical Materialism. Leftovers is an online communist discussion group having spilled out into what boomers call the real world due to the current pandemic it has now been forced back into the virtual realm for Historical Materialism 2020. Um, following on from the huge success of last year's Leftovers panel of strategic political readings of Marx for the current conjuncture covering topics such as Engels' fam family in the origin of private property in the state and Marx's university dissertation on Democritus's and Epicurius's differing views on atoms, we got most of the band back together for this follow-up, reading Marx and Marxism in the age of uprisings and pandemics. So let me introduce to you our panelists for today. Um, we've got Jules Joanne Gleason, who is a Londoner based in Vienna. Her work has been published in venues including Viewpoint Magazine, Homintern, Invert Journal and Vice focusing on Marx, humanist philosophy, regimes of masculinity, intersex liberation, and the transgender question. She co-founded and helps run the Leftovers Communist Discussion Group and is the co-editor of the collection Transgender Marxism, due out in May of next year with Pluto Books. Geordie Cummings is, an adjunct, uh, is adjunct faculty at York University and an active member of the Canadian Union of Public Employees, Local 3903. He has been called the tin pot barrier of the counterculture by Spiked Magazine's James Hartfield. And if that's not a compliment, I don't know what is. Um, Aaron Jaffe is assistant professor of philosophy and liberal arts at Juilliard in New York City and a member of the Red Bloom Communist Collective. If you can check out his book, Social Reproduction Theory and the Socialist Horizon, Work, Power and Political Strategy out with Pluto Press, November 20th and available for pre-order now uh, I think we're all really excited about that book. Um, and our respondent today is Izzy Plowright, who's a graduate student in history at Columbia University and a member of Red Bloom. They are interested in the history of capitalism and 19th century Marxist movements and their dissertation research focuses on the first international in America. Uh, so just sort of briefly to the structure of the panel, we're gonna begin with Jules, who will be presenting on Marx as a satirist through a reading of the early text on the Jewish question. Um, then considering different questions raised by that same text, Geordie's gonna come in looking at Marx's positions as against both the reactionary anti-Semitism of Bruno Bauer, as well as the mystical true socialism of Moses Hess, relating these to current political coalitions and the question of the particular and the universal. And then Aaron is presenting on the evolution of Marx's um, concept of primitive accumulation, framing it as an inherently political as well as logical and historical concept, deeply relevant to ongoing struggles around dispossession and the reproduction of capitalist social relations. After which we're gonna hear Izzy's responses. Um, and after that, each of the panelists will have a sort of short few minutes to respond to those responses. Uh, after which we're going to throw it open to questions which should be posed, should be asked in the uh, YouTube chat function. So um, without much further ado, I will pass the floor to Jules. Thank you very much, Alan. Is everyone hearing me okay? Okay. So I wanted to begin this talk with a brief run through of the so Jürgen Frage, and um, what we might euphemistically call its 20th century reception, because I see this text as remarkably cleanly split into two halves for our easy consideration. So the first half of this essay is presenting us with Marx as a scientifically treatable theorist, and the second is quite a more controversial fellow, as I'm going to get into, and then as Geordie is going to explore in our second talk. <laughs> 
So in part one, it's easy to take uh, Marx uh, as he appears to us as a thoughtful and thoroughgoing critique of the modern state, and particularly as well, uh, well attuned to a remarkable degree, in fact, to what today often enough gets dismissed by many Marxists as mere identity politics, grounded in what Hegel would surely call an over-reliance on identity thinking. Uh, by contrast, while preparing this manuscript for our forthcoming anthology, Transgender Marxism, uh, myself and my co-editor, Elia Rourke, decided to include the following long quote um, from this text. And uh, we're trying to give a reader, we're trying to give the reader a chance to grasp the nuance and skill with which Marx addressed these questions of social particularity. Um, so here Marx writes, the po political annulment of private property not only fails to abolish private property, but even presupposes it. The state abolishes in its own way distinctions of birth, social rank, education, occupation, when it declares that birth, social rank, education, occupation are non-political distinctions, when it proclaims without regard to them that every member of the nation is an equal participant in national sovereignty, and when it treats all elements of the real life of the nation from the standpoint of the state. Nevertheless, it allows private property, education, and occupation to act in their own way, i.e. as themselves, and to exert the influence of their special nature. Far from abolishing these real distinctions, the state only exists on the presupposition of their existence. It feels itself to be a political state and asserts its universality only in opposition to these elements of being. So to some extent, I consider the reason this essay uh, at present languishes in a sort of relative obscurity next to um, some of Marx's better known work, at least in Anglophone scholarship, is because by this point, Marx has been thoroughly associated to a sort of dualistic opposition to cultural questions, Judith Butler's the merely cultural uh, distinction where cultural is opposed to the material or questions of social particularity, especially from an embedded viewpoint are sort of opposed to systemic or logical thinking. So we're sort of urged to set aside all of these matters and, and do proper Marxist research. Um, so I'm not really gonna go into the, the guts of that which involves um, post-Marxism uh, post and other trends at the moment, but I'm just gonna flag that up as one reason um, but uh, not only because this text straddles that distinction, that apparent divide, do I think it gets neglected. The more obvious reason, the second reason, is uh, the second half of the essay moves, um, moves towards addressing uh, his fellow late German idealist Bruno Bauer in a quite a different tone. So at this point, we sort of see this veering from Marx as a theorist and into passages which seem to express outright bigotry, or at least absorb and reflect Bauer's remarkably and informed polemic, um, which Georgie's going to get into it a bit more, and conceding to his more conspiratorial fantasies. So um, whereas Bauer rails against this notion of Christian and Jewish coexistence, uh, which he sees as kind of flimsily posited by those uh, confronting the question, um, uh, Judenfrage too seems to frame uh, Christendom as already fallen, and perhaps even capitalism and money lending itself as this culturally Judaizing force. So um, whereas for Bauer, this sort of anti-Semitic trope laden critique of Jewish life and thought has a sort of purported even handedness at the start of the text um, of his, his Judenfrage. Uh, uh, Bauer says, nobody who has not gone through the flames of criticism will be able to enter the new world, which is soon to come. So for Bauer, it's a sort of equalizing thing. For Marx, it actually seems that Christendom uh, itself is what sort of is in need of some redemption from this kind of money bound and perhaps essentially Semitic fate. So needless to say, for contemporary readers, this portion of the text can be far too much to stomach. Indeed, one liberal philosophy professor who I discussed this text with even admitted to only setting the first half of the text to avoid discouraging her students altogether. A very liberal solution, I like to think. Um, so yeah, so this section of on the Jewish question is the one that saw this text come to prominent use by uh, 20th century US uh, Cold War warriors as a means of tarring Marx either as a self-loathing Jew or even a genocidal anti-Semite. For those minded towards horseshoe theory of totalitarianism, this text was obvious gold dust. One anti-communist edition of this material even fabricated a quote as if the text's verbatim phrasing was not bad enough for the front cover, which ran, imagine a world without Jews. This was, this was Marx's platform according to these anti-communists. So um, in fairness to anti-communism, considering the following passages scattered throughout the second half, it's quite clear to see why this essay was beloved by these smear artists. So here Marx says, the Jew has emancipated himself in a Jewish manner, not only because he has acquired financial power, but also because through him and apart from him, money has become a world power and the practical Jewish spirit has become the practical spirit of the Christian nations. To use today's idiom, this is well beyond problematic. 
So um, tempting as it is, let's set aside this contemporary resonance of the spectacle of right-wingers and right liberals tarring a revolutionary Jewish writer as an anti-Semite, right? Let's instead pose a more difficult question. What can we uh, make of these passages? What can we do it, do with them? So a more forgiving reading among Marxists or friendly readers of Marx, including Robert Fine, and also on a more localized level, many German speaking reading groups I've encountered runs as follows. While the first half of the essay may seem scientific, or as we'd call it today, theoretical, the second half sees Marx flex his muscles as a satirist. To, to, true to Marx's typical style, he conducts an imminent critique, accepting the claims of Bauer to a remarkable extent, only to prize them apart at the last moment, displaying in this way um, their facile logic, which is an internal logic. So for Marx on face, we see um, um, Bauer granted the chimerical nationality and groundless law, which um, Marx also drawing from Moses Hess, as George is going to get into, uh, and his account of the Jewish inhabitants in the modern state. He then uses this set of claims, which he's accepted, to show up the limits of his rival philosopher's social theory. So David Leopold has described us as Bruno Bauer's uh, Hegelian anti-Semitism. And here, of course, it runs into contrast for Marx thought as a Jewish Hegelian, or at least a Jewish hate reader of Hegelians. Um, and Marx responds with, to these kind of hateful attitudes and genuine, genuine um, general, sorry, anti-Semitic comportment with a sort of never to be outdone attitude which perhaps is familiar to us from some revolutionaries today. So at this point, I don't want to dwell too much on this particular text, but instead treat this argument as something of a springboard um, to allow us to skip between Judenfrage part two and Capital volume one, particularly as read by Keston Sutherland's essay, Marx in Jargon. And those of you who know me or follow me online will surely have grown a bit bored of me hearing talk about this, but here's another chance. Um, particularly, I want to focus on Sutherland's innovative reading of the queer thing, as he translates it, or mysterious thing, Verdachtinger, of the commodity. And the commodity's um, fetish character requiring the sort of double take to uh, reveal itself. So, um, so when reading this, this essay, Marx in Jargon, and its other approach to, to Marx's satirical later work, I sort of want to um, not only overturn the now sort of bygone distinction between early and mature Marx, which I'm sure many of us have already discarded, but I want to explore more the continuity of an immature Marx, that is the in-joking rogue that is found at once throughout his personal correspondence and also to a remarkable degree, um, if inconsistently across his published works. So from this text through to the economic and philosophical manuscripts, especially pronounced in the um, text which would later be compiled as the German ideology throughout the Gundrisa, especially in its remarks um, uh, around the behavior of capitalists and then in capital. So um, I haven't actually read Marx's final works in the Russian Mir, but if anyone has done, I'm happy to chat about whether his comedy survives there as well. But um, at any rate, in the original preface of volume two, Engels, um, this is quoted by Sutherland, Engels um, refers to Marx's notes, which he was trying to render into a publishable form. He says they were written in a language in which Marx had always used to make his extracts, a careless style full of colloquialism, often containing coarsely humorous expressions and phrases interspersed with English and French technical terms. So this mottled quality of dispersal of apparently technical exercises in thought and biting sweeping dismissals of those same disciplines uh, was usually associated, um, basically this is usually associated by new readers to Marx as one of the most difficult and impenetrable features to getting through any serious amount of his text. So later in the same essay, Marx and Jar Jargon, um, Sutherland returns to this question of the fetish twice. Firstly, as a fetish character, and secondly, the fetishisme, first found in the uh, 18th century anthropologist, Charles de Brosses. In de Brosses, the literary weight of this inquiry um, into the fetish and fetishism is framed against the astonishment which the assumed um, Berger reading the text finds in comparing his own lifestyle and belief system to the assumed savages which are described by the anthropologist observer. So Marx takes things uh, considerably further, rather than animism and object worship appearing as foreign adulteration to another sensible and well mannered Western norm, his notion of the commodity fetish character sort of replants um, the absurdity, mystery, or queerness in the um, basic existence of bourgeois life. So this is a very delicate argument, but also Sutherland suggests a tacit rejection of the bourgeois style as a thoroughgoing one um, and plays off the place of this uh, presumed reader in what he calls the dramatist persona. I'm just gonna read from his conclusion, Sutherland's conclusion that is. Um, he says, Das Kapital deterns not only the jargon of 
um, de Brossa, but also the whole satiric drama of sympathetic mutuality and rescue. It blocks the reductive processing of determinant into an array of concepts to be held at the disposal of theory by anticipating that this is what bourgeois readers will want to do with it. So admirably clear in this essay, the agenda is challenging an approach of reducing Marx to what he calls pure theory. Um, this injunction to read Marx uttered by Althusser and however many others, which actually results in a certain shying away from the text. By contrast, Sutherland argues that attentive reading to Marx actively resists this work of um, reduction to theory at every turn. So the work of academics to rehabilitate Marx for science will always be one operating with the stifling of Marx's satirical style, um, which contains so much of his content. So needless to say, I find this a compelling argument, both on its face and also as a disciplinary uh, exercise, extolling the merit of the discipline at hand, which is philology. However, the nature of philology is to open far more questions than any one essay can possibly resolve. So I suppose what I would like to do to wrap this up is to sort of tie this into an exemplary trend, because uh, it's sort of exemplary of a trend I've noticed in recent years of Marxist scholarship. So everything from Michelle Heinrich's convincing disassembly of worldview Marxism um, to the inaugural episode of the Real Abstraction podcast with a notion of Marx uh, and Marxism being best described as anti-scientific socialism was sort of floated quite amusingly. And so basically in short, this is the, the gathering consensus of Marx as a critic. And I think, um, I think this is a helpful one, this kind of literary comic or implicit um, subversive, but it sort of runs us into some more problems as we start to sort of discard the notion of Marx as a scientist, either in the German sense of the word or any other, um, sociology, philosophy, economics, or whatever else. So Marx as a comic critic sort of reframes him as this grand troll in the history of thought. And um, one perhaps not immediately obvious consequence is a great new burden on the shoulders of those attempting to grasp this material. So not only do you need to plod through page after page of the finest 19th century polemicist, but also you need to read a whole lot more material so from the 17th through to the 19th century from the more kind of bourgeois normie um, academics to have any chance of hoping along, of laughing along with this um, with this, with this um, material. So this sort of marks with the jokes included approach uh, at once sort of shows us a newfound challenge, but also I think is, is helpful for sh sort of showing us why it is that so many times we see, um, we see, see sort of uh, a reduction of Marx's material, say to its Gramsci and Althusserian and Unoist or whatever form. So, um, right. So to sort of, uh, wrap up. I think I'm going to need to take another minute. Um, yeah, so basically, I had another quote from trying to illustrate the sort of problem which appears when um, you begin to do this. So I would just like to sort of read this out to you first, and then hopefully this is going to show you the nature of Marx as a satirist and sort of where this runs into problems in the academy. So US historian uh, Robin D.G. Kelly talks about the mentorship provided to him by the famed black Marxist Cedric Robinson um, when he was preparing for his dissertation. So he talks about how he was sent a letter dated June the 21st, um, 1985. And this letter says uh, uh, from Robinson informs him. So after taking me to task for his haphazardly, for my haphazardly treating of the historiography, he advised me to temper your literary voice and to stop editorializing. Of course, I was trying to write like C.L.R. James, W.E.B. Du Bois, Walter Rodney and Karl Marx, full of sly humor and sarcastic digs at the ruling classes. Cedric wasn't impressed. From what little I know of the profession and particularly the de department at UCLA, neither sarcasm nor direct political charges will be tolerated by almost any reviewing committee you might construct. Save your judgments for the published version of your work and not for the dissertation. So um, I think this kind of highlights the problem for a one foot in, one foot out approach to the academy, which incorporates Marx both in style and in content. So as we develop a clearer understanding of Marx, um, whether we're talking about redaction criticism of Heinrich or philology of Sutherland or whatever else, surely we sort of open up this problem with um, making this type of scholarship compatible with the productivist and desiccating demands of contemporary professionalized scholarship. Some people would say so much the better, but more challengingly still, to what degree can we ditch academia while still cultivating circles familiar and willing to work through a demanding array of capitalist theorization and racist anthropology from the 18th to 19th century. Apparently this is required for a reading of Marx, which includes the jokes. So particularly philology risks becoming 
something of a Marxological Ouroboros, at once chewing away at weaker readings that de-revolutionize Marx or bring him into the academy, while elevating necessarily skill sets cultivated most reliably within that very same context responsible for the process. Okay, thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Jules. And I mean, I just having gone back to Capital Volume One um, during during the lockdown and sort of come to hugely appreciate Marx as a satirist and the huge amount of sort of sly asides and witty jokes, but the argument that that is perhaps something more that Marx as a satirist, that the satire of Marx is part of his dialectical method, I think is a compelling one. I look forward to discussing it. Um, so now I will pass over to Jordi, who's also talking about uh, to Judenfrage on the Jewish question and uh, the debates between Marx, Bruno Bauer and Moses Hess. So take it away, Jordi. Hi, everybody. Um, it's uh, good morning to uh, my fellow North American comrades. Uh, afternoon to others, evening to others. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back uh, presenting here at HM, even if in the virtual realm. Um, so I'm just going to dive right in because my paper kind of flows out of um, flows out of Jules's excellent um, presentation before. Um, of the many questions debated among uh, left Hegelians, uh, sometimes known as young Hegelians, the Jewish question or the Judenfrag was emblematic. Bauer, of course, as we've heard, um, stood firm that, to put it simply, Jewish emancipation was an oxymoron. Marx, in response, like just to be schematic, stood firmly for Jewish emancipation, yet he also believed this emancipation, as Jules was saying, um, was only political emancipation, was partial. But one of the lesser known aspects for us to really kind of complete this kind of circle um, is Marx's all later polemic uh, with the true socialists, uh, as embodied most, uh, most well known as, as Moses Hess, or as he was known at the time, Morris Hess, and I'll get into why he renamed himself. Uh, the contours of Marx's polemics with both these figures prefigure a debate still in existence within the 21st century left intelligentsia, to put it simply, identity politics debates and all that they entail. This is the degree to which particularity can be re represented within universality, etc. To put it in simpler terms, Marxist analysis stands in between one hand, Bauer as emblematic of the so-called anti-woke left, and, uh, you know, uh, Bauer saw particularity in the form of his figure of the Jew as a fetter on a project of emancipation. And, you know, a range of figures, queer folks, black people, uh, indigenous people in North America and many others um, in the Americas, I should say, um, filled this void for today's quote, critical critics. But in turn, this figure of the Jew for Hess had to completely achieve particularity in order to even approach any project of universality, indeed, Jewish universality or Jewish particularity becoming universality had to precede any program of human emancipation. As with Bauer, we do hear modern, modern echoes of this from forms of left nationalism and populism to some forms of Afro-pessimism. Indeed, Hess's mystical dialectical discovery in his later book, Roman Jerusalem, of anti-Jewish prejudice being constitutive of Gentile being finds resonance in a lot, of, uh, a lot of modern thought, a lot of modern nationalisms and separatisms. In other words, what I'm trying to do is examining Marx, um, the, the rogue, the young rogue, as Jules put it, as a participant in uh, the foundations of radical left, socialist, and communist parties, as well as the development of what we now call critical theory. Um, these are debates that still exist. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have probably seen Raoul Peck's Young Karl Marx, which is quite impressive in capturing um, this reality, um, encouraging a decentering of Marx that if in effect recenters Marx. Marx is no longer this uh, Althusserian figure who discovers a continent of knowledge, um, though he still is. Um, but in this sense, and the sense I think it's useful to look at, uh, that these panels um, try to look at, is uh, he was a participant. He's the one that we know now because he had the better ideas, um, for lack of a better term. There's a famous scene in the film, for those who've seen it, I'm not spoiling much, um, in which he, he addresses, uh, as arranged by Engel's partner, um, the League of the Just, which became the first international. Uh, right before Marx, we see this speaker, a fellow communist, effuse, like a new ager. He's talking about the brotherhood of man and uh, peace and harmony among mankind, mankind, of course. 
Uh, knowledgeable viewers may have seen this as a representative of the true socialist current, best embodied in the enigmatic figure of Moses Hess, an uh, inveterate defender of Weidmann. Um, a little in-joke there. My own paper today picks up from where I left off last year, as uh, this is kind of a, a second part, um, in examining Marx's relationship to this question, less so in the form of his review of Bauer's text, which is um, what the what Jules was speaking about, but more broadly the question itself and the polemic that carried between Bauer and him through a series of debates, which I believe culminated in the Holy Family, which uh, was kind of Marx's kiss off to the whole kind of left Hegelian milieu, in which Marx proverbially calls Bauer out for his reductionist proto-anti-Semitism. Um, Marx kind of showers him with compliments, but then subjects his arguments to a ruthless and satirical imminent critique critical critics, um, you know. Uh, the point was, as he later claims, uh, and uh, about Feuerbach and the limitations of his left Hegelian comrades, is they failed to actually recognize a unitary reality in concrete, real human existence. Herr Bauer thought it necessary to, about quoting Marx, Herr Bauer thought it necessary to imagine a critical state, a state which is nothing but the critic of theology inflated into a state of Herr Bauer's imagination. I just I cut the quote there, but this is critical criticism. The limitation of thinking, this is me, not Marx. Uh, this is critical criticism, the limitation of thinking through what we would now call the quote, task of the left. In response, Bowers, um, as I kind of talked about last year, was like, oh, me? Mar Marx responds to him, quote, with, uh, Marx quotes him responding to a Jewish rationalist who points out that Bauer denies the reality of the Jewish contribution to modernity. Even Bauer shit talks Spinoza at one point. Um, uh, Bauer scoffs. An eyesore is something to do too, but does that mean it contributes to my eyesight? Jews were, to use the title of Eric Wolf's book, um, a people without history to, to Bauer. Uh, Marx's reply is worth quoting. Something which has been an eyesore to me from birth, as the Jews have been to the Christian world, and which persists and develops with the eye is not an ordinary sore, but a wonderful one one that really belongs to my eye and must even contribute to my highly original development of my eyesight. To step back for a moment or to step forward for a moment into today's context, there's, it's, as it seems, renewed interest, and luckily so with the, uh, the rise of the far right, um, in the Jewish question. Um, it, after all, this Jewish question to this Jewish question is a consistent point of implicit and explicit re reference for uh, an emergent set of Marxist theorists, Enzo Traverso in particular. Um, the absolute centrality of anti-Jewish violence to the project of modern reaction in both its conservative and fascist forms um, is just there. Um, from the Dreyfus Fair to the pogroms, from the Shoah to Jews will not replace us, the figure of the Jew in the reactionary imaginary bears far more inquiry beyond the mechanical and stagist accounts. These stagist accounts, often focusing on the myth of the economic Jew or the Geldmensch, prefigure so-called class reductionist takes on anti-Black and anti-Indigenous racism or queer phobia. On the other hand, they can serve to reinforce, and this is in the case with Hess, as I will imply, Zionism, a certain particularism uh, rooted in a stagist account of the Jewish question, only slightly different from the flawed but useful um, people class theory from those of you who are familiar with Abraham Leon's work. As Jules pointed out on the Jewish question was the text in which Marx kind of first formulated what we can perhaps call a unitary analysis of social relations, the edifice to the emergent set of social property relations resting upon private property, hence their very idea of opposing Jewish emancipation in particular on the basis of what I would call Bauer's quasi-theological uh, anti-Semitism, did violence to Marx's still yet uncompletely formulated, um, according to Althusser, not to the mathematical manuscript, Zing, um, communist social theory. Against Bauer's atheism that nevertheless ranked religions, as Leopold points out, um, contrasting the universality of Christianity with the particularism of Judaism, Marx saw this distinction as just besides the point, and as Jules put it, he trolled Bauer. Um, and, you know, there have been many, you know, notable Marxist readers um, of the Jewish question who've actually kind of taken him to task, um, notably Hal Draper, Michel Lowy, and more particularly Enzo Traverso, that Marx is here unconsciously absorbing the myth of the uh, economic Jew or Geltmensch. Um, 
I am not sure if that's the case, but um, we do want to see that Marx is uh, sitting on a continuum. Um, at one end of this continuum, we see Bauer, who's uh, one form of reductionist replete with contradictions, uh, which as I say, Spinoza could not have been a free thinker because he was a Jew. And on the other hand, we see the flourishy, new agey brotherhood of man preacher Hess. Hess was labeled the communist rabbi. And later on, um, as I pointed out after his break with Marx, and I'll add, he actually introduced Marx and Engels to the communist movement, uh, a foundational figure for Zionism. Um, indeed, um, no less than Vladimir Jabotinsky, um, who we might know as the founder of revisionist or the far right of Zionism, um, sta stated that he was one of the two or three people most responsible for the signing of the Balfour Declaration. Um, bad abstractions to the left of him, reduction, reductionism to the right, Marx was stuck in the middle with Engels. And yet a proper Marxian um, con consensus on the Jewish question is yet to emerge. In the case of this question, this set of double deviations has served to reinforce, as I say, on one hand, a more particularist approach as found in the later work of Norman Jaras or uh, Marxist Zionists, like uh, one time Israeli, zip Israeli diplomat Shlomo Avneri, an admirer of Hess. Um, and uh, on the other hand, um, it served to kind of downplay or even erase historical anti-Semitism and anti-Jewish violence and conspiracism. This duality is what makes, to my mind, Traverso's framing of the question, and it is recently reissued um, right here, Jewish question, history of a Marxist debate, and it's 50% off right now, HM Books. Um, quite useful. To this day, there is an ongoing oscillation between these two positions. There is a common sense belief, it seems, that anti-Semitism is a fading phenomenon, um, and Jews being broadly assimilated, middle-class white people no longer live in a skin of enforced particularity. This is not to say that there's a denial of the current rise of anti-Jewish violence, far from it, but there's an implicit denial of the specificity of the figure of the Jew. Um, and in contrast, equally problematic, there's an increasing sense, and I don't want to go too much into this because I want to keep mine in mind time, but there's a set of, I, I'm seeing this among younger far left, by no means Zionist, far left, um, mostly Ashkenazi Jews um, in North America, who uh, want to deny their whiteness and say that Jews are quote unquote people of color. And you know, I think there's a number of problems with that one, though Jewish whiteness is contingent. Andrew Traverso makes a strong case that Marx adopted the Geldmensch fra framework more or less directly from no, no, none other than Moritz or Moses Hess. Of course, to be clear, Hess was far from the caustic reductionist like Bauer. He was by all accounts a scrupulously kind of moralistic man, a very upright character. He married a sex worker to, uh, as he told his colleagues, to save her. He was the paradigmatic true socialist that Marx later lampooned in German ideology, again, Marx the troll, and the manifesto. As Sidney Hook and his Trotskyist years pointed out, true socialism was a genuine theoretical current in the German-speaking intelligentsia, rooted to a large extent in Hook's reading that neither the bourgeoisie nor the proletariat were strong enough in numbers to really um, formulate an agency. So uh, just to, to put it simply, and those of us who've read Ellen Wood's uh, retreat from class know, um, true socialism as a whole basically formulated socialism purely in the realm of thought as guided by intellectuals. Having, moving, having moved beyond Feuerbach um, in terms of the critique of religion, their social critique was still detached, willfully so, from any concrete or scientific analysis. That is to say, in the realm of pure speculation, like Bauer, the figure of the Jews could only achieve universality in its own nation, in its own territory, as constitutively the Jews' particularity is what renders, renders us, I'm Jewish, uh, universal. And that would have to involve a specific to Hess, a specific national project. See, the irony of Hess's position here and of the position that developed among true socialists, um, though Hess in particular, is it seems to be a literalization of the line in the internationale, we have been not, we shall be all. Indeed, Hess likely came to a concentration on formulating a dialectic of Jewish particularism in the face of his disgust alongside his comrade Marx. And let, to be clear, they were close comrades. Um, they do panels together at HM. <laughs> um, uh, came to a concentration uh, uh, with Bauer's with his discuss with Bauer's reductionism, as in his later book Roman Jerusalem. Unlike Marx, 
he seems to accept Bauer's terms of the debate. And this is, this is the issue here, the two-sidedness that comes to the same side. Painting, painting a backdrop of contending intellectual currents, socialism, humanism, humanism, cosmopolitanism, uh, cosmopolitanism, Bauer is clearly attempting to poke through the hypocrisy of the likes of Bauer, yet his scorn is mostly reserved towards Moses Mendelssohn and the Haskalah, the Jewish Enlightenment that gave rise to Jewish to Reform Judaism, and indeed was ostentatiously about assimilation and the classically German concept of Bildung. Predating Adorno in a cryptic way, Hess sort of sees a dialectic of enlightenment. A Haskalah had failed to Hess, it had failed to harmonize the imagined community of the Jews with rationalism and cosmopolitanism after all. To proponents of Haskalah, many of whom overlapped with socialist and free thinking movements of the time, Judaism was a religious and cultural community, not a nation. Yet to Hess, this seemed nothing more than petty bourgeois ideology redolent to the minority of Jews who had escaped the ghettos and come to the cities. After what Hess saw, correctly saw as the only partial emancipation that took place in the wake of, as one of the concessions in the wake of the failed um, 1848 revolutions. Most dangerous to Hess was the spate of conversions taking place, especially among Jewish atheists. He should talk to Marx's dad sometime. Um, instead, Hess, like Bauer, like Bauer, a lot like Bauer, if we really look at Rome and Jerusalem, saw a very specific particularity to the Jewish people. Yet while for Bauer this particularity was reactionary, it was uh, a step down from Christianity that became universal, for Hess it was mystical. It was kind of a, a secularization of uh, the chosen people myth. Um, Hess was perhaps onto something only in seeing the precarity of Jewish assimilation in a part of Europe, which only 50, 60 years later bore the Shoah. And indeed his positing of what we can call the invention of a quote, blood and soil myth for Jewish people was implicitly articulated in the frame of refracted class struggle. The Geltmensch Jews, I just a little bit wrapping up, uh, the Geltmensch Jews who wanted assimilation really wanted more comforts to be in high society in Vienna and Berlin. Hess, would, Hess is like, didn't they know that all the Goyim hated them, proverbially? Um, like Hess's disciple Herzl, an atheist freethinker, Theodore Herzl, the founder of Zionism, strongly affected by the Dreyfus affair, um, which, as Traversa points out, the left was a real mixed bag on. Surprising. Hess saw Jewish liberation refracted through the lens of constituting a new independent Jewish political subject, in a sense, kind of living out Marx's satirical line in the second part of their Judenfrag, emancipating Jews by abolishing Judaism. And in a sense, that was the entire mission of the Zionist project, of erasure of the Haskalah, of Jewish communism, of Jewish socialism, Jewish cosmopolitanism, and indeed assimilationism. Yet the rational cur current, to paraphrase the disgusting Kutron, was that there were limits to assimilation. Limits seen by the Bund in East Europe, to be sure, and indeed among some communists, um, notably Benjamin and Trotsky. Yet as Traverso points out, Marxism's approach to the Jewish question, while always squarely defending Jewish emancipation and opposing pogroms, anti-Jewish violence, etc., was that of favoring assimilation or really seeing uh, that Kotsky is the best known example of this, that assimilation would teleologically lead to atheism and eventually the disappearance of Jewish particularity and Jewish cultural um, cultural community, so to speak. The figure of the Geltmensch would melt away and indeed the Geltmensch was historicized, not inadequately, but in a reductionist way. This only began to shift, as I say, with figures ranging from Trotsky to Benjamin, yet only the latter until recently was able to see the universality of a sort of antinomian particularity in the figure of what Isaac Deutscher later called the non-Jewish Jew. It should be clear, however, that Hess's ideas um, were purely in the realm of speculation. Um, while he did talk about settling the nation of Israel, there's those who say, well, there is debates as to whether he specifically meant um, Palestine or not. I think he did. Um, Marx wrote of the likes of Hess in the manifesto of how um, to return to Marx, return to Marx. Marx wrote of the likes of Hess in the manifesto of how the true socialists and their opposition to the liberal gains of liberal gains as illusory makes the claim that Quote, to the absolute governments with their following of parsons, professors, country squires, and officials, it served as a welcome scarecrow against the threatening bourgeoisie. That is to say, true socialists and later Zionism presented no threat to either the bourgeoisie or the aristocracy, 
as their system would be built speculatively. And after all, it proclaimed Germany to be the model nation. It could seem that he was saw the internal logic, Marx saw the internal logic of the communist rabbi's limitations. To conclude, let's examine, or let's return to the ongoing debate that Marxism has. And you know, there was a great um, panel with Ashley Bohr and Holly Lewis uh, yesterday and Paul Reynolds as a uh, discussant. There's um, continuing throughout HM, we're returning to these themes, I believe on the last day, there's a, it's a round table on identity politics. I'm really looking forward to Jules and Els. Um, <clears throat> uh, talk on their book, Transgender Marxism, tomorrow. But um, I, this is what caused me to kind of return to these themes in my paper last year. Um, it, Marxism is continuously having to, you know, navigate the co-constitutive quality of various identities within the context of class. Uh, to draw on Stuart Hall, identities being the medium within, we, we, within which we live our working class or petty bourgeois uh, lives. Bauer and Hess stand as two sides of the same coin. One that denies the possibility of liberation on the basis of, for example, blackness, queerness, indigeneity, et cetera. On the other hand, one that proclaims the impossibility of liberation, positing the constitutive, except as separatism, positing the constitutive and naturalized qualities of patriarchy or anti-black racism as providing an impetus for separatist projects. One leads to the other, and both accept the terms of the debate that stipulate the impossibility, for example, of black liberation as part of a communist project, or indeed of communist project being a part of black liberation. Marx was able to see past these opposing poles. Marxists must continue to do so. Thanks, everybody. Excellent. Thank you, Jordi. Um, and I got to say, I just think this reconstruction of the debates of the young Hegelians and their political states is such a rich um, vein in terms of thinking about contemporary politics and this um, sort of intersection of it with Zionist debates and sort of Zionism as a bourgeois ideology within those debates, I find, I find fascinating. I think about Bruno Bauer a lot because he's buried two minutes from my front door in Berlin. So I find myself uh, thinking it is sort of in his later years became increasingly reactionary and uh, ended up running his brother's farm and uh, dying just down the road from me. Um, so now we um, get on to our last paper before we hear Izzy's responses. And uh, that's Aaron, who I'm handing over to talk to, um, to talk about primitive accumulation as a political concept. So take it away, Aaron. Hello, everybody. Um, and thank you uh, to Evan for chairing, for Paul for organizing, Izzy for your comments in a little bit, um, and also Jules for creating the leftover space, which is deeply enriching. Um, request an ad on Facebook. Um, I check it out every day. Um, so this paper is going to be a little bit different from reflections on the Jewish question, though it will have some hooks or links into the young Marx as well. I'm going to chart a middle course in my discussion of primitive accumulation between, on one hand, those who develop a politics out of primitive accumulation by using it to refer to contemporary dispossessions, and on the other hand, those who depoliticize primitive accumulation by relegating it to an account of a prior epoch, a mere historical condition that once fulfilled need not be bothered with again. The latter camp reads primitive accumulation as originating, as kickstarting capital, and just stops there. Since the transition to capital is over, primitive accumulation can have no political meaning today, so it holds. Now the other camp offers the view of an extended primitive accumulation which has the virtue of highlighting the dispossessive and violent nature of capitalist social relations. But the view tends to lack, sorry, the view tends to lose track of the genesis of capital, as well as its unique and self-sustaining force. By following Marx and his evolution in, this, in determining primitive accumulation, we can, however, I think, avoid both pitfalls. The upshot will be a, a bounded view of primitive accumulation, which is rigorous in the account it can provide of the transition to capitalist social relations and a political reading of those social relations as beholden to the afterlife or legacy of the violence and domination through which primitive accumulation was accomplished. We do not, in other words, need to sacrifice the view of primitive accumulation as historically past in order to make its lasting effects salient for radicals today. 
Marx's primitive accumulation is developed in the Grundrisse, in the economic manuscripts of 61 to 63, and it is not until late in the drafting of uh, what would become theories of surplus value that finally, and, and then finally, of course, in capital, that we get what may be considered Marx's unique uh, or a distinctly Marxist determination of the idea. In primitive accumulations, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna chart that trajectory um, and show you where I think it ends up. In primitive accumulations first appearance in the Grundrisse, Marx stresses the specific nature of capitalism that is revealed by primitive accumulation. Primitive accumulation provides a key to seeing capital as a social whole that unites circulation and production in a new way. I quote, Capital, in order to become capital, presupposes a certain accumulation. For the circulation of money to augment the value of capital, it must flow from and expand already existing stocks of capital, and this previously existing stock must have been accumulated in some way. Marx is making a logical claim about primitive accumulation that in no way touches on where, when, how, with what, if any, justification or motivation that prior accumulation occurred. Against the idea that primitive accumulation is an ongoing process, Marx and the Grundrisse is adamant. I'll quote again. This accumulation, which is necessary for the genesis of capital and is therefore already contained in its concept as premise, as a moment, is to be distinguished essentially from the accumulation of capital, which has already become capital, or capitals must already be available." End quote. In the draft of theories of surplus value, Marx again begins by using primitive accumulation in much the same way as he did in the Grundrisse. Primitive accumulation provides the conditions for a new and self-reproducing regime of accumulation. Marx again stresses that a mode of continuous reproduction must be distinguished from the conditions that made that mode possible. I'll quote, accumulation merely presents as a continuous process what in primitive accumulation appears as a distinct historical process, as the process of the emergence of capital and as a transition from one mode of production to another, end quote. Here, however, a crucial refinement in Marx's approach is already visible. Rather than think of primitive accumulation as a logically necessary idea, it is now described as a distinct historical process. Marx holds onto the logical insight of a precondition that he developed in the Grundrisse, and then thinks this precondition not only logically, but now historically. With history integrated, a critical approach becomes possible, and Marx indeed begins to develop that stance when he constructs it no longer as primitive accumulation, but so-called, so genannte, ursprüngliche accumulation, so-called primitive accumulation. This formulation is how the concept appears on the stage in capital, but it first occurs rather late in Marx's economic manuscripts of 61 to 3. There, Marx's analysis of so-called primitive accumulation reveals the laws of capitalist production are neither natural nor transhistorical, but obtain only for a, quote, particular historical stage and under particular historical conditions of production, end quote. This approach prompts the biting conclusion that primitive accumulation, which looks so idyllic in the hands of liberal Cretans, is a most melancholy and tragic story. Marx has the tools to flesh out primitive accumulation in a social story that is deeply violent. And this violence helps Marx object to what he has already been consistently constructing as a social relations changing and capital originating process. Without ironic scare quotes or so-called attached to it, primitive accumulation remains for Marx and capital, a logical and historical distinction that makes the specific nature of capital possible. With ironic scare quotes or the sardonic so-called uh, attached to it, primitive accumulation is not ironizing the primitive or originating force of primitive accumulation as if the process of inaugurating capital's self-expanding logic was ongoing in the 1860s, no. Instead, the target of Marx's irony is the violent secret of capital's prehistory, a prehistory that remained hidden in previous determinations of the idea. I think he has in mind Smith, perhaps also um, Stuart, but maybe less so Stuart. Primitive accumulation, the historical transitional process that inaugurated capital's own self-expanding force was real 
and through its violence, it created the social relations through which value in a new and specifically capitalist form became a socially dominating force. The primary agent of capitalist accumulation is of neither the individual accumulator of stocks, no matter how voracious they are, nor is it state policy pushing industriousness through, though in capitalism both are, of course, present and highly enabled. Rather, as Marx has been holding all along in his insistence on the specific nature of primitive accumulation, capitalist social relations themselves, once generated, support and deepen their domination of proletarians. The peculiar force of capital is then located in the distinctly capitalist way of growing value through the exploitation of labor dominated in new and specific ways. In order to develop criticism of this force, Marx turns to the structure and edifying effects of religious origin myths. And these are the opening lines of the discussion of primitive accumulation in Capital, Volume 1. It's a slightly extended quote. I'll let you know when it ends. The primitive, this, Marx writes, this primitive accumulation plays in political economy about the same part as original sin in theology. Adam bit the apple, and thereupon sin fell on the human race. Its origin is supposed to be explained when it is told as an anecdote of the past. In times long gone, there were two sorts of people, one the diligent, intelligent, and above all frugal elite, the other lazy rascals spending their substance and more in riotous living. The legend of theological original sin tells us certainly how man came to be condemned to eat his bread in the sweat of his brow. But the history of economic original sin reveals to us that there are people to whom this is by no means essential, and such insipid childishness is every day preached to us in the defense of property." So-called primitive accumulation provides a just-so story. It provides moral support for capitalist social relations, which we've seen Marx insist on understanding, not simply as some quantity of stocks, but as a dominating force. The solution for Marx is to refuse this kind of legend as the intellectual food of the infant. In drawing a parallel with religious stories, Marx is suggesting that there is a strong pull to fetishizing dominating relations across many modes of production. Like the previous epoch's reliance on the story of original sin, capital too claims natural legitimacy through its own dehistoricizing myths, the myth of an idyllic previous accumulation. History is only conceivable to the likes of Smith as the history of a continuous way of doing things, a history of infinitely extended and therefore nearly invisible violence. It is difficult to adopt a critical vision that looks behind or beyond the dehistoricizing effects of either an indefinitely extended present or one's originating myths. Yet I think this, is, this critical vision is at the very core of Marx's radical project. To push that project forward, he needs to criticize religious myths like primitive accumulation, so-called. The criticism of religion for Marx as far back as the 1840s provi provided the premise of all criticism because it, because it forces a confrontation with how we actually produce our existing social reality. The, re the religious frame situating the capital's discussion of so-called primitive accumulation therefore goes a step beyond reified consciousness that's revealed and criticized in the economic manuscripts discussion. It allows us to see the quasi-religious function of political economy in capitalism as pushing us to, at, to accept, as if it were fated, the melancholic and tragic story of earlier violent accumulations. In rejecting this economic come religious story, we can follow the young Marx who already held that the criticism of religion ends with teaching that man is the highest being for man, hence with the categorical imperative to overthrow all relations in which man is debased, enslaved, forsaken, despicable. However, the dispossessed are forsaken, such domination is for Marx categorically unacceptable. Seeing this history as setting up fundamentally new, that is distinctly capitalist forms of social domination, requires for Marx and capital, a political response that generates far more than just this moral condemnation. Marx's politics, and this is my key point, ties this moral condemnation to the specific social violence of self-reproducing capitalist orders. 
in centering the new form of social domination produced by primitive accumulation, Marx pinpoints and makes further specifiable the broader set of social relations that must be transcended. With this in hand, we can see how in its final articulation, primitive accumulation remains a logical and historical category, but it is also at the same time a deeply political concept. Again, it helps to turn to Marx's criticism of religion, which ended with neither criticism, as it did for Feuerbach, nor with the abstract moral imperative to end all relations of domination, as it would be for um, an apolitical moralist, or perhaps maybe even uh, uh, the kinds of socialists that, that Jordi was referring to in his, in his talk. It actually prompted Marx to turn to increasingly fine-grained historical research, research that saw temporally limited processes retain the power to condition, that is, to set the rails for evolving capitalist social relations. Of course, primitive accumulation is precisely one of those past processes. Though it is past, its forms and results shape capitalist society's relations of domination today. Just as the criticism of religion needed to move beyond Feuerbach's determination of the human essence as abstractly sensuous and needy, here too, the criticism of primitive accumulation must be grounded in the specific social relations it sponsored. For the young Marx emerging into his radical commitments, Politics requires more definiteness, more attention to the actual state of affairs, more expert knowledge. Just as in his polemics against the young Hegelians and then Feuerbach, for Marx, political pursuit of freer social relations must be grounded in anger at generalized unfreedom, as well as specific and evolving relations of domination. Political response to violent legacies of primitive accumulation requires paying careful attention to the possibilities developed out of evolving capitalist social relations of domination and proletarian responses to it. We cannot derive political lessons about primitive accumulation, Marx concluded writing to um, Russians in his old age, employing the all-purpose formula of a general historical philosophical theory whose supreme virtue exists in being super historical, as in his youth, Marx is insisting that politics be grounded in careful social research. That some contemporary forms of capital's violence look strikingly like the violent dispossessions of primitive accumulation should, in this light, not be surprising at all. Despite such stark similarities, it is valuable to resist construing contemporary forms of domination as origins, uh, I'm sorry, as ongoing instances of primitive accumulation. One can object to violence in general, as well as to its specific instances, without transforming a concept that explains the transition to capitalism into either a transhistorical one or one that loses its specificity by insisting that there are always violent conditions enabling capital social reproduction. Extending the concept of primitive accumulation in these ways confuses what made capital possible, the violence without which capitalist societies couldn't have become what they are, with how capitalist societies are actually produced here and now. In other words, capital's extension into new communities and the persisting and deepening violence of capitalist social relations within communities it already dominates are better understood as how capital, capital operates today rather than via the category Marx used to understand how capital became such a dominating and expansive power in the first place. Conflating the proletarian dominating violence of capitalism as such with both the violence of its genesis out of something distinct and the specific violences that, comp that comprise, extend, deepen, and generally reproduce capitalist social orders needlessly dilutes the work Marx's transitional concept does. Though all primitive accumulation requires dispossession, not all dispossessions, historically or today, are best thought of as primitive accumulation. Indeed, telling a story that conflates the violence of genesis with the violence of extension or social reproduction risks, like the story of original sin, obscuring what needs to be seen precisely to be strategically challenged. In this light, a political response to primitive accumulation requires more than simply condemning the violence of all dispossessions, though we should also do that. In my view, primitive accumulation need not be taken as the simple bald fact of separation from the means of production. It can instead be used to describe how social relations were transformed by disciplining um, people into becoming proletarians through racial, ethnic, ability, and gender hierarchies. Nuanced understanding of these specific shapes 
of these historically new social relations, and not just the fact of their construction through and production of violence, points us towards the political dimension of Marx's primitive accumulation today. Using primitive accumulation to highlight the move to new capitalist social relations and the oppression specific to them allows us to, keep, to see capital society's different mechanisms for dominating proletarians and crucially provides a schema for further specifying those violences. Once we see how newly capitalist social relations engender their own expanding social reproduction, we see the need to focus on the specific, often violently dispossessive, ways that this social reproduction proceeds. A revolutionary response to primitive accumulation today would then respond not only morally and categorically to the fact of violence, but strategically to how the social afterlife of primitive accumulation inflects the specific violences and oppressions through which capital social relations are reproduced here and now. Limiting the scope of primitive accumulation, perhaps counterintuitively, actually better helps us see and respond to distinctly capitalist violences that the history it names has both made possible and continues to influence in their trajectories. So to conclude, those who extend primitive accumulation into the present politicize the concept, but they do so in a way that loses the specificity of capital as a self-reproducing and expanding social order. On the other hand, those who understand primitive accumulation as merely originating capital while closer to Marxist thinking, tend to neutralize any possible political stakes by consigning the category and the history it names to a mere prehistory of capitalism divorced from what's going on today. Yet capitalism is a historically evolving social order, and it's shot through with the evolving oppressions through which it came into being. More than the logical fact of proletarians separated from the means of production, capitalist societies have deep hierarchies organized around race, gender, ability, indigeneity, as well as existing and only nominally overcome colonial and imperial subjections. The political project of overcoming capital itself would then need to be tied to the historically infected social relations that engender accumulation and rely on agents dominated but never entirely disempowered through the combined contemporary effects of those historically inflected violences. And I'm done, sorry, I'm sorry I went over time. Excellent, excellent. Thank you, Aaron. Um, and I think for myself, at least, like the best papers, what you managed to do was really latch on to a thought that I've had kind of half formed in my head and, and express it in an erudite and coherent manner that there's sort of the idea that there's these quite persuasive uses and positings of primitive accumulation um, in the present, which um, though persuasive might at the same time be inflationary. So I think this is this is a really fascinating line of investigation. Um, before we hand over to Izzy for the responses, I'd just like to remind everybody watching at home that um, after Izzy's responses and the brief responses of the panelists, we're gonna throw it open for questions. So already be thinking about what you wanna ask the panelists uh, and their going to be written in the chat on the YouTube, which I see some people are already reading. Uh, reading. So uh, now we're going to we're going to hear Izzy's responses to, to these three papers, uh, after which the panelists will have a kind of brief few minutes to respond to the responses. So take it away, Izzy. OK, um, well, first of all, thank you so much for these delightful papers today. Um, I believe that all panelists um, took up Jules's invitation. Um, for a forgiving or generous reading of Marx, uh, which foregrounds the role of Marx as a critic. Um, this, of course, allowed our panelists today to bring Marx into the present and draw out the political stakes of his writing in a quite sharp way. So first off, we had Jules um, bring us towards a question of the immature Marx, um, while also discussing the history of the reception of on the Jewish question, uh, which included its anti-communist and liberal reception, particularly enjoyed um, Jules's remark on the liberal professor here, not assigning the second part of the text. Um, but Jules does discuss the two sections of the text in quite a provocative way. Um, as she argues, um, Mar the commonplace sort of reading of um, this text is that the first half is you know, Marx, the scientifically minded theorist, while the second is the much more problematic uh, Marx, as it were. Um, so in, in this sort of reading, Marx is often read for this sort of dualistic opposition between a cultural versus materialist um, uh, 
uh, sort of writer. Jules is inviting us to a very different reading of this classic text. Um, she argues that in fact, the first half can be read as theoretical, while the second should be read as satirical. Uh, she takes up Sutherland's reading of the double take, which is necessary to understand the queer thing in Marx, um, in particular drawing attention to the concept of fetishism. Um, Marx in this sort of reading is engaging in a form of détournement, um, so turning the terms of fetishism on itself. This brings us to the heart of Marx's sort of critical angle. So through satire and détournement, we can see clearly, much more clearly, the critical edge of Marx and how he turns the Bauer's terms in on the Jewish question against themselves. Um, which then brings us, of course, to Jordi's paper. Um, so Jordi brought the Jewish question in its more contemporary iteration, um, specifically highlighting the role of the Jew in the reactionary imaginary and the rise of the far right. But Jordi also uh, foregrounds contemporary debates in the left through sort of this analysis of Jewish particularism versus universalism as it appears on, in, on the Jewish question and in Marx's polemics against the true socialists. Marx's analysis stands between on one hand Bauer's reductionism and on the other hand Hess. And Jordi was particularly perceptive in sort of bringing out the contemporary stakes of Hess's analysis um, and, and Hess's Zionism. Jordi um, takes us through Marx's an, uh, unitary analysis of social relations by identifying a convergence between Hess's critique of Haskalah and assimilation on one hand and Bauer's reactionary texts and its identification of a Jewish particular in a more reactionary idiom. Um, this takes us to then Aaron's paper on primitive accumulation, which provided a rigorous and detailed account of the concept of, concept of primitive accumulation as it appears in Marx. So while Aaron's thesis um, goes against the concept of um, primitive accumulation as ongoing, um, he specifies it as a historically bounded moment. Aaron does not deny the violence and devastation brought about by the accumulation of capital. And in fact, he tells us that uh, uh, analyzing primitive accumulation as a specifically historical and logical moment might actually allow us for more specificity in a sort of contemporary analysis of the accumulation of capital. So what Aaron does is um, locate primitive accumulation not as a trans or super historical concept, uh, but one which allows us to understand a very specific origin point of capital. Um, Marx was, after all, building on and critiquing uh, Adam Smith's interpretation, um, which outlined a necessary accumulation of the creation of capital. Um, and Marx's critique of this concept is specifically for, for foregrounding violence. Um, and then Aaron, of course, opens up uh, the possibility that we might take uh, an analysis of um, contemporary sort of capitalist relations uh, without um, without uh, under underplaying this this sort of violence, which was at the heart of Marx's critique. Um, so there's some points that I wanted to highlight um, here as two sort of points of convergence or um, similarities um, in the sort of um, like um, in, in what all panelists highlighted in Marx's role as a critic here. So um, the first one here, I think, is uh, just how much, like the depth and relevance of Marx's critique of religion. Uh, so I don't want to belabor this point too much because I really, I am sure that it's going to be taking it up in discussion. But, you know, our, Aaron brings us to think of Marx's um, critique of bourgeois economists uh, from a, primitive accumulation through Marx's uh, sort of uh, polemic that this uh, view of primitive accumulation is in fact akin to uh, the view of the original sin. Um, Marx specifically challenged just so stories. Um, and Jordi actually takes us through the critique of religion, but specifically to think about the relationship between universalism and the particular. And Jules, I think you really brought this forward here. But we can see in um, your discussion of on the Jewish question and on this sort of new, um, not new, but sort of a uh, reading of Marx and the queer thing as um, allowing us to think about the terms of fetishism. 
and specifically how fetishism moved from a sort of 18th century anthropological category um, to then be turned against um, sort of bourgeois Christians, as it were, through thinking of the commodity form um, as, as, as fetishism. Um, so I think that all of, um, and this is sort of like a question in general um, for the panel is, you know, how do you think, well, Aaron, um, how much would you sort of um, link, how much do you think sort of like the critique of original sin and primitive accumulation is relevant to us now and how is it relevant to us to think politically now? Um, Jordi, I think I would take up on um, specifically um, what is what concept of emancipation do we get from Marx in thinking for his critique of religion? Um, and Jules, I would just ask you to sort of expand a little bit more on the relevance of like um, categories of fetishism uh, in Marx's critique of religion. Um, and then uh, I would like to take us to sort of the second uh, strand that I identified that I thought was very exciting in this panel today, um, which is sort of uh, Marx's satire. Uh, his tone and his humor in his writing and how this uh, through a sort of Marxological reading in which we historically contextualize the debates that Marx was caught into, we can understand the purpose that sort of humor served um, as a critical edge. Um, I think this was especially apparent in Jules's reading of Marx as a satirist. Um, but Jordi also brought us uh, Marx as a polemicist uh, and specifically writing against Hess and Bauer and the role of satire in constituting those critiques. And as Aaron reminds us, we should never forget about the so-called in so-called primitive accumulation um, and specifically how this sort of serves as a critique of bourgeois categories um, and the liberal fantasy of a nonviolent origin to capital. Um, so I'd like to thank our speakers uh, and thank you for bringing Marx into the contemporary and I'm looking forward to sort of seeing the questions uh, for all of our speakers. Thank you. Excellent. So thank you so much, Izzy. Um, and do we have uh, one of the panelists who would like to sort of uh, begin with um, speaking to, to Izzy's responses? sort of answering those questions that they threw out. Yeah, Jules? Yeah, I switched camera there, my mistake. Hi, um, so regarding this, this fetish character and its theological ramifications, so uh, we received a comment saying that I was speaking rather rapidly for some people to understand, so I will try to slow to a crawl here. Um, so, in, in Sutherland's essay, the nerdy philological point concerns um, fetishism as opposed to the fetish character. So, fetishism is indeed the term um, de Brosser is using. And um, Sutherland is arguing that the, the, the truer translation of this um, very heavily loaded section of Capital Volume One is is to talk about the the fetish character um, of commodities. And personally, I do see this as a a very significant point and and a, a bit of pas a, a passage I'd often return to, um, even with this understanding of of um, the commodity is mysterious, which is the more common translation. And you. Uh, you sort of run into an interesting point here where Marx's materialism is such that it seems to continuously veer off into uh, what most people would talk about as, as spiritual, um, perhaps transcendental, phenomenological points. And um, I think this is especially clear in, in this passage and others. And what I think the, the satirical point, which was sort of what Marx and jargon, which I was spending most of my talk recapping, I suppose, was suggesting that this satirical, this like the satirical charge of this is that this is something which bourgeois readers, bourgeois anthropologists, bourgeois whoever, are prone to externalizing. So they're prone to saying that this is something beyond civilization. 
And um, an interesting question is how far Freud does this, by the way, um, talking about other influential theorists of the fetish. But at any rate, um, at any rate, um, in, in Marx's deployment specifically, the point is to sort of undercut this and to, to like twist this thing around. And this is actually why I think, although the, the essay Marx and Jargon doesn't dwell on it, considering it as the queer thing, um, which is a phrase, is it repeated is, is, is very interesting, I would say. So this is like the, there's, there's sort of a two, there are two, firstly the fetishism and the fetish, fetish character, and secondly, Marx's, um, Marx's discussion of this, this uh, require, you need to make several passes over the commodity to see what's really going on, is sort of interlocking with his refusal of um, earlier anthropologies tendency to sort of rely on astonishment. So this is a specific thing. So in the earlier discussions of fetishism, which he's sort of drawing on and also reversing, there's this notion that you encounter someone worshipping an object or or performing some kind of veneration of a pot or a object which you, th you see as having no deeper value and you are shocked at this process. And Marx is kind of trying to exactly show up that there isn't really a basis for that kind of a distancing. So that's the sort of satirical point. Um, I hope that's clarifying. Thanks a lot for the response. Uh, okay, uh, Aaron, Jordi, would uh, one of you? All right, um, a few questions to address for that. I guess I'd start with the, the quite a big question that Izzy asked me. Um, what's the vision of emancipation I see in Marx's critique of religion? Um, I guess I would answer that kind of sideways um, because I think Marx, what Marx is kind of saying to Bauer um, and also what Marx writes in the intro to the critique of Hegel's philosophy of depending on which edition you have, you know, which text I'm talking about, OP to the masses, etc. cetera. Um, Marx is basically saying in that passage, the OP to the masses, but heart of protest, heart of a heartless world, et cetera, um, atheism is besides the point, man, like, come on, Christopher Hitchens, come on, Richard Dawkins, like, this stuff's passe, we've already been through this shit. Um, but what Marx is critiquing or criticizing, um, critique's not a word, um, anyway, um, joshing a bit here, um, is religious logic. So religion is a private affair. You know, um, perhaps Marx thinks that religion is a, like many Marxists in, until the first international, um, basically thought that um, religion would melt away. And perhaps he was right, perhaps he was wrong, but this is religion being a private affair. With that being said, um, the critique of religious logic, the logic of the fetish logic of capital, um, the fetish logic of the state, the hypostatization, I always stumble over that word of, um, of reality to create a sky god and so on and so forth and alienated social relations. When we ergo disalienate, you know, as an international project, our set of social property relations to bring about, you know, what I like to call communism, um, this kind of will take us away from this kind of religious logic, but that is not to say, you know, I have a lot of respect, whether it's liberation theology or the kind of theological um, Marxist or historical materialist um, kind of turn in Benjamin's uh, later work and his communications with, uh, with Shalom. Um, so I don't necessarily think that religion as such or mysticism will fall away with, you know, a new world, but religious logic will. Um, and go on to too long there is other thing to address um is you know i i've seen a, a, an increase in interest in speaking about the jewish question in particular with traverso's book and i knew traverso's book since it was reissued um you know there was this uh I, I might have a piece coming, uh, I think, on the HM blog at some point. Uh, Igor, I believe his last name is Shoid Broad. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly, had a review uh, in Marx and Philosophy Review of Books of Traverso's book, which is basically like making a Hessian Avenarian, Shoma Avenari being uh, an Israeli diplomat um, and a uh, great historian of Marx and of the Left Hegelians, uh, against Traverso. And in writing 
a proverbial hit piece against Traverso, completely misrepresenting the text. Um, Igor basically um, takes his takes Avenari and Hess's side against Marx. Um, but that's just me being a little bit of a sectarian. Um, but I guess what I would get at is that once we start talking about this question again, we're going to start, these old issues are going to start coming up again. Um, I guess those in the German speaking world are more familiar with these arguments being made from the left, but um, perhaps we're going to start hearing them in the English speaking world as well. Um, I don't know if that was too far afield, um, but I'll leave it there for now. Hey, thank you for the question, Izzy. So um, it was a bit ago, so I, I heard it as, um, how much would I link um, the criticism of original sin in Marx's discussion of primitive accumulation to um, political stakes that are live here and now? Yeah, okay, cool. Um, so I, I think that in, in a certain, um, I, I wanna say it's, it's really relevant. And I wanna say it's relevant um, in, in two, two different ways. First, I think what Marx is doing when he's criticizing original sin is he's criticizing Adam Smith, who says that um, we, there's this just stocks got accumulated. Uh, I don't know how, there's just a certain amount of accumulation that happened. Uh, and that like gave the motivation for increasing efficiency and industriousness um, and like kickstarted um, further divisions of labor and growth of wealth. Marx is like that, wait, you can't just, sure there needed to be some accumulation prior to greater divisions of labor, um, but the way that Adam Smith is telling that story is kind of like the story of original sin in that um, it, it says that there is a one and done. It says that it was faded. It doesn't explore the violence appropriate to it. Um, and it's supposed to be morally edifying. For Smith, it's a good thing that although it might have been a harm initially, um, is still really important for us now. But Marx criticizes Adam Smith by describing primitive accumulation as so-called, um, as being like original sin-like. What he's really saying is, this is not morally edifying. This just gets us to swallow property relations appropriate to capitalism here and now. Screw that. Like, don't, don't accept that kind of just so story. Okay, so that's that's what that's one avenue of response is, is um, thinking of primitive accumulation through the lens of original sin politically relevant today. Hell yeah, because if we refuse that, we can reject the kind of stultifying effects of a morally edifying discourse about some sort of like, or, like you know, easy to come by prior accumulation. Now, the second, and I think for my purposes, um, a little bit more um, contemporary and a little more specific, um, is that um, when people over, what I'm calling overextend, of course they disagree, but when people overextend the concept of primitive accumulation, like original sin believers, they are saying it is still with us, it is still ongoing, what happened previously inflects the flesh, inflects the domination that still persists to this day in ongoing form, the sin is repeated. I wanna say it was a violent prehistory that has effects in us, but to, uh, to think that original sin is still happening, is still like a dominating force here and now, misses the specificity of what it in, was to inaugurate, misses the specificity of what primitive accumulation inaugurates. <clears throat> that is that capitalism is its own socially dominating force. If we can get rid of the idea of original sin that persists with us today, if we can get rid of the idea of primitive accumulation that persists with us today, we can see more specifically the forms of violence and domination appropriate to existing social orders. And that's what we've really got to see specifically to effectively challenge politically. Excellent, excellent responses. Um, thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Jordi. And uh, thank you, Jules. And thank you, Izzy, for those sort of covering an incredible amount of ground uh, in such a short time in your response. Really fantastic. Um, now we're throwing it open um, for questions from the floor. Um, so please pose your questions in the chat. I know that otherwise we've got um, like we've got questions that are waiting. I know Izzy's got a got a question lined up, and Paul, our man behind the scenes, who's responsible for the smooth running of everything, uh, has also phrased a wonderful question, and I myself have one. So. Uh, maybe we can take those as the first round while we wait for people's 
kind of minds to sort of whir into action and uh, to fire off your questions in the chat. So maybe I'll just um, ask Izzy to begin with their question. Okay, so I'm very sorry to do this, but it might be a little bit more of a comment than a question, but I don't want to be that guy. Um, one thing that I was thinking about is in the differences, subtle differences between the three ways that you tackled sort of a reading of Marx's texts. Um, well, I think there's a lot of overlap, but I think um, Jules, you took us almost to the point of philology. You definitely sort of got us to think about, you know, what terminology um, was Marx drawing from? You know, what were the terms of the debates? How did he turn the turn? How did he turn the terms of the debate against himself? Um, and, and sort of, you know, really trying to think about um, the sort of um, meanings of words and meanings of like the context in which um, Marx was operating. And, and specifically, I think that becomes important for humor and like sort of detournement and sort of um, how satire works because you need to understand what is being satirized. Jordi, I thought that you did a different but related thing, which is to sort of understand the political cult context of Bauer and Hess. But I think something that you did um, is that you took us to thinking through their intellectual trajectories. So you sort of went, well, this is where Bauer ended up. This is where Hess ended up. If you sort of push the logical, um, their logical arguments, then you actually end up like Hess becomes an anti sort of, sorry, Bauer is an anti-Semite. Bauer was also an anti-Semite, like while Marx was writing on the Jewish question, but and, and Hess becomes a Zionist, and and then you're able to sort of see where particularism ends up. And Aaron, you take a much more sort of okay, well, these are the economic manuscripts um, in the 1860s, and this is how Marxist thinking over so-called primitive accumulation um, travels um, throughout Marxist texts. Um, so I was wondering if you could sort of comment on these approaches and why you sort of selected this approach in uh, reading Marxist texts um, and what we can learn from them. That's my question. Yeah, and I, I think given that that's a sort of a question posed to all um, all panelists, then we'll take this first and then move on to Paul and my uh, questions afterwards. So go ahead. Uh, yeah, so uh, sorry. <laughs> Who okay. would like to begin with answering? Aaron's unmuted, so. Uh, let's go maybe reverse order. Um, and I'll try to be um, kind of quick. Yeah, it feels really good, Izzy, to be seen like that. But yeah, that's that's what I was trying to do. Thank you for being such a, a good reader. Um, and yeah, I'm trying to trace the trajectory. I'm trying to show how Marx has an idea that's kind of actually close to Adam Smith initially. There's just a logical prior amount of, of accumulation that was necessary to kickstart the like a new form of social relations. Um, and then he moves through what I think is a, a like a Stuart, a, um, Sir James Stewart approach, but inverses the values, right? Like Stuart set and recognizes that primitive accumulation is going to be violent. And he's like, yeah, but it's a good thing. Marx is like, no, no. Uh, and, and then he becomes um, what we know of as Marx once he starts thinking with the so-called primitive accumulation. And um, I, 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 I read historically, I'm, I'm kind of like a history of ideas type person. I think it's important to see the trajectory of ideas and where they're coming from. I think too often philosophers just take uh, an idea in its isolated context and they're like, here's what it must mean. I'm like, no, the ideas are alive. Let's see the work that they're put to and how they change over time. Um, but so, so that's that's why I do it the way I do it. Um, probably also just my background training, uh, unreflected. Um, but the, the last thing I'll say, I guess, is that um, I, I actually, I wanna be deeply sensitive to, to the irony and to the rhetoric and to the um, kind, of, kind of sardonic tone and the way it works on both sides for Marx. Because even though Marx is criticizing primitive accumulation as being a just so religious story with original sin, he also describes the um, effects of primitive accumulation as a text written in blood and fire. And I take it when he says that he's, he's writing it um, as, he's writing oblique references to the passion of the Christ and the sanctifying fire of the Holy Spirit. Um, and so when he does that, he's, he's taking on the force of religious rhetoric, um, but transforming it from an edifying moral tale to something that's like gonna motivate people to challenge property relations. Uh, and I think that that's um, the rhetorical use there of something that's gonna be powerful uh, in to, to his own political ends is important. Um, and, and truly, truly the last thing I'll say about that is that his daughter um, actually recognized uh, 
that that's in fact what he was doing. Um, in a letter to Johann Becker, Jenny recognized what Marx was doing when in Capital he wrote with those terms. Okay, Jordi. Thank you, Aaron. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I'm glad to have, to be seen or recognized here as well because um, I guess again this is like partially interest, partially training. Um, I kind of like to read political theory um, in the fashion of Neil and Ellen Mason's Wood, the late, both of them the late, first it was the late Neil Wood, um, which is the, <clears throat> the social history of political thought, which uh, in which theory is neither reducible to its context nor deducible from its context. And while avoiding teleology, um, you know, to say, okay, person X or theorist X starts with this position, that means there's a sort of path dependency that they'll end up with that position. I like to examine the internal logic, whether it's, you know, whether I'm writing about or doing a paper on uh, Hess and Bauer, or, you know, writing about, you know, Angela Nagel, or, or something like that, just looking at the, um, what the implications are. You know, and then you could see, for example, um, you know, to, to use the examples of some of the stuff that I've written about, about the modern day or about modern, the modern day, modern times. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the piece I wrote recently for Spectre about Glenn Greenwald um, and a few others and about his siding with Bannon, because you could see the logic in his thinking and then look at in the last couple of months or just in the last month, Greenwald and just his like kind of public tantrum around quitting the intercept and, you know, just smearing all of his colleagues. I mean, you could take this to the simple terms, just like what goes on in the world of like left media, like social democratic media, so to speak, or you could take it in the terms of looking at the early, the early poetry or the early literary work of a writer and see how it, or if you look at, for example, Leonard Cohen or Bob Dylan and look at some of their early poetry and their early work and how it kind of prefigures, how you could kind of predict when you read like Beautiful Losers by Leonard Cohen, um, the subject matter that he wrote about 50 years later. You know, there, there's kind of, Adorno calls it late style when you when you looked at, when you he looked at late Beethoven and late uh, others, but Beethoven's the notable example that comes to mind. And I like to, you know, as a cultural critic, kind of look in the other way and not, I forget the exact passage, the passage of the Grundries about the ape and the man, you know, but to look at that passage, not as in the, man, the ape is guaranteed to become the man, but to look at that trajectory that was possible. I don't know if that makes any sense. One other thing I'd want to add without going too much over um, in my own time is that the interesting about, thing about Marx and Judaism and his response to, to Bauer and the Holy Family is, you know, taking pride in the eyesore, so to speak. Um, as someone with an eyesore myself, solidarity. Um, Jewish people or Jewish theology, in whatever its variants, don't cast the, don't turn the other cheek. You know, we don't like forgive everyone. And I think that that, you know, that could be in terms of what Aaron was speaking of, in terms of, you know, original sin. You know, Jews don't buy that shit, <laughs> so to speak. Um, we, you know, uh, it, obviously that term is abused by like um, by all manner of of uh, you know violent or reactionary forces. But I, I think that, that there's an interesting connection that's yet to be unpacked between Marx's Jewish background and his awareness and not pride, but his acknowledgement of this background and his unique ability to uh, kind of shit talk original sin. And, and on the wonderful ending note of uh, shit talking original sin, uh, thank you, Georgie, and I'll pass over to Jules. Yeah, so um, this question of method, which Izzy is bringing us back to is, yeah, I suppose that's the, the core of the paper, right? Because usually my approach to method is pretty pluralistic. I suppose like some people are gonna want to do a nerdy close reading and read several of the original manuscripts and see the development of 
of a text across time, which will show us various interesting things. Um, I guess I'm thinking here of like, you know, recently there was this book by George um, Comnell, which I uh, reviewed, which was, um, you know, demonstrating that the German ideology had, uh, uh, was far from being a break from earlier Hegelians, actually had a large section by one in its original form. You know, there's, there's nerdier approaches in manuscript um, work throughs like that. You might want to mash together the logic of capital with something like Lacan to see what happens when you mix it up with saying else completely as many um yeah many scholars have tried to do like there's all kinds of approaches to Marx which I think can be more or less fruitful I suppose when it comes to um the when it comes to the bolder assertions of uh essays such as the one I was working through from Sutherland or um perhaps even Robert Fine which are proposing that there's one sort of interpretation uh, which should sort of win out. So, for instance, if you if you go along with Sutherland, um, any time you encounter someone using fetishism and fet fetish character in an undifferentiated way, then surely you will feel um, triggered or offended um, by this this transgression from the original text and its original literary intention. Um, I certainly do. Uh, but the problem is, is simply that but not the problem, but the challenge which is, this presents, there is an aspect of uh, to the victor, the spoils, like if your discipline, um, you think if your dis discipline provides you with a sort of supremacy, we're sort of moving through into a stage where we then have to consider the social, um, the social form, the social context, whatever you want to call it, the institutional background, there's several ways to come at the problem. And you have to realize that you're reconfiguring the acceptable shape of Marxists, or at least um, Marxian scholars. So that's sort of my my question of method, but I think that's enough for me. I think there's also another question, so. Brilliant, thank you so much for those uh, those wonderful responses to um, Izzy's second question. Um, so let's move now to this question that we've uh, had fired at us by, uh, by Paul from behind the scenes. Uh, another great question uh, that I'll read out for you. Uh, I think it speaks particularly to Jules, but uh, I think also also to jo uh, Jordi, and I think it's a broader question also of sort of rhetorical strategies. So I think everyone can, if everyone feels they can speak to it, then by all means. Um, your discussion of Marx's satire opens up the issue of rhetorical strategy, which is often overlooked in reading all Marx as if all his writing is of a singular analytical tone. Can you say more about both the importance of rhetorical strategy, humor, metaphor, satire, as of strategic value in the different forms of his writing, pamphlets, journalism, and political intervention? Shall I maybe just go quickly first or? Yeah, do you wanna, do you wanna begin, Jules? That's great. Cause I just spoke, so I'll try and be quick. So I think probably one way of testing Marx and Jargon and other satirical, um, satirical, comic critical, whatever you want to call them. One way of testing these things is probably to run some comparisons within, uh, as Paul is kind of alluding to, the different um, forms, the different sort of contexts, the different audiences rather, which Marx was writing for, because I would say that it, it certainly does seem, although this is a consistent feature in so far as it's basically present in all ones, if you compare the the amount of the text which is devoted to this sort of inside baseball material, it's clearly going to be to pick two extreme examples the, to, between German ideology and Gothic critique. Um, I, I would say obviously German ideology is saturated with this, whereas I think Gothic critique has relatively little. So that's one way of going about it and kind of seeing if Marx was really um, concerned about this as a way of expressing himself, like what, what to what extent did he use this irrespective of the audience? Although another question this sort of gets us into, inevitably, a question this gets us into is what uh, purpose capital was written for, which is a big dispute in itself. So um, many people have have um, held true to the idea that capital was written as a, uh, a weapon for the working class, as Harry Cleaver has put it, whereas Michel Heinrich in his recent, I was an Ivy League talk, I forget which uh, college it was for, but anyway, he gave this Ivy League uh, Zoom talk the other, the other uh, day where he sort of uh, expanding on his his argument to suggest that there's kind of re no real basis for calling capital sort of a book of the people. It was hugely overpriced in its German form. And then by its English appearance, um, it was sort of belated and talking about um, economic methods, which were sort of obsolete in um, economic political economy scholarship. So, um, so that's like another big question, like what was capital for? So that's uh, an inevitable problem we sort of are gonna run into when we're trying to answer this question with regards to satire. Okay, that's more than enough for me, thanks. 
Great, thanks, Jules. Um, who would like to go next, Jordi? You thinking? Otherwise, we can uh, we can we can move on if people are I not. Can, yeah, I can I can jump in. Um, I think it's the letter to Kugelman, or I think where he says like there's a distinction between the mode of exposition and the mode of inquiry. And uh, yeah, I, I agree with Paul's question that. Um, if you read Marx as a whole, you know, and Jules mentioned Jules Com, uh, Jules meant Jules Comnell, George Comnell. I I happen to have the privilege of having studied with him. I we parted ways over certain things, but um, the, a great teacher of Marx, um, in particular his classical Marxist theory seminar. Um, you see almost, and I I, I often will use the examples from culture that being someone who writes about culture or music, like that great band that you can always recognize, yet they have so many different styles depending on the era and the audience, you know, and, and on a simpler level, and I think of like, I'll often teach wages, price, and profit, or I, the name might be wrong because there's a lot of similarly named texts, so it's not right at the top of my mind. And he's able to articulate a lot of what he articulates in Capital later on, in a far simpler, it's where he first really formulates labor power, um, in a far simpler way for like apprentice workers, you know, but then he's able to write that for, you know, the more advanced layers of the pro value price and profit. Wages, so there's also wages, there's another text, wages. Uh, yeah, I'm mixing the two up. Thank you, Izzy, um, in the chat. Um, it's been a while. Um, I haven't taught this text in years and I haven't read it in some time, but, um, you know, he's able to, for different audiences, make the same argument in different ways. And this often will trip people up because, you know, especially, and I like some Althusser, but especially Althusser, um, where he tells people not to read the first chapter of Capital, um, because um, Althusser has one way of reading Marx, and then there's others who have one singular way of reading Marx. And then it trips them, whether it's Althusser or someone that I'm more sympathetic towards, like uh, Bertel Ullman or um, uh, et cetera, Lukash, um, will often impose a singular method of reading on a multiplicity of methods of writing. And Marx started it as a journalist. I remember taking a, a seminar with Marcelo Musto. It was like this, I, people might know his work. He's a real um, Marxologist and he, and he is a philologist as background. And it really pissed him off when I said, you know, Marx was a journalist. This is all different forms of journalism. I, that's my own background. So I was kind of projecting myself onto it as a young grad student. But these are all just different methods of getting to your audience and also trolling them and also working on a multiple level of multiple levels of meaning. Um, so again, you know, this is something that I think that those of us on the left who switch our idioms, I try and do so myself between a popular audience and a left audience and a academic audience, which are three different audiences, really. They overlap, but they're three different audiences. We should keep that in mind and kind of look at our own writing some of the time and say, uh, how, what do we do when we're trying to reach a popular audience? What are we doing when we're trying to reach our students or our comrades? You know, um, I try and talk to my students the way I talk to my comrades, at least. Um, and what are we doing when we're writing in an academic journal, so to speak, um, or academically? And... I think that we should both examine these barriers between these rhetorical tactics, but also try to break them down a little bit. And I think that there's too little humor, you know, in a lot of Marxist writing. Um, folks here notwithstanding, I will say, but I think that there's too little humor. So a few of us are in this J. Ross Banerjee reading group right now, and everyone's kind of aggravated at him. Um, to a certain degree, whether we like his, whether we like where he's coming from or not, but I'm kind of impressed because I think Jairus is just trolling his audience, and I think sometimes there's room for that. I think there's sometimes room for trolling. There's sometimes room for grand data tactics on the level of also being a history of commercial capitalism. I'll leave it at that.
Okay, um, so uh, rather than uh, ask if Aaron and Izzy would like to speak to that, we've uh, now got a question from the chat, excitingly. Uh, I think it emerged from the debate raging about whether or not Marxists can use Zoom, yes or no, um, which is, which is uh, quite kicking off in the chat. So the question is, uh, from Scout is taken, um, is there any person today you recommend for the questions original Marxism cannot solve, for example, the question of innovation? Videos with Anwar Sheikh are nice, but his book is too dense. <laughs> So I don't know if anyone uh, anyone feels as though they uh, they they can speak or would speak to that. Oh, can I give it a shot? Um, yeah, uh, Shake's book's dense. I, I I read as much of it as I could, but I'm not trained in math, so I had to skip over some of those some of those sections. Um, and I I think I think it's important to try to figure out what are the guiding forces in um, the social relations that dominate us? Like what are the laws of motion, of value? How are we dominated? What can we do about it? And I don't want to pretend that if I just read Marx, I'm going to have all the answers. Um, and I don't want to pretend that Marx, just because he's old, dead, and um, you know, contingently white, uh, like, you know, it should be ignored. I think he's got some really helpful conceptual tools. Um, even more than that, he's committed to grounding analysis in existing flow of relations. Um, and so I think it rhetorically matters how we do that, depending on the audiences we're trying to reach. You know, when we talk about primitive accumulation, which I've been studying for a little bit now, it's like one of the most popular and accessible and even indeed politically motivating accounts of primitive accumulation, I think stems from um, Silvia Federici's classical text, Caliban and the Witch. But I deeply disagree with that text. And I recognize it's been politically informative for people um, in, in some radicalizing ways. So I think it's a really good question. I'm not sure I have a single answer to it. I, I hope we can develop texts that, to my mind, um, um, have, have a more appropriately limited notion of primitive accumulation, but are still rhetorically motivating in, in the effect that they have on people. Because say what you will about Federici, but she, she can do that. Great, thank you, Aaron. Uh, Jordi's gonna come in on that, and that's uh, yeah. So we'll take we'll take Jordi, and then if Jules or Izzy have got something, then we'll move on. Just uh, to quickly, because I actually I had to someone was knocking on my door, so I didn't hear the question. But uh, I guess um, I saw Evan type of the question: Is there someone alive today who I can recommend for the questions original Marxism can't solve? Um, and I take the question to ask, like, are there non-Marxists? Because there are plenty of Marxists that address this or that theme. I mean, if we're talking about capital, um, like capitalism, Anwar Sheikh is one that I would, and Howard Baldwinick, um, a few others that I would strongly recommend. With that being said, I think people should be reading outside of Marxism um, and should be even reading outside of, you know, um, Ashley Bohr made a great point yesterday that we need to be reading people who aren't even necessarily just because they're not anti-capitalist. You know, what I took from her point, um, her talk on uh, her book, uh, Marxism and Inter Intersectionality, um, yesterday was to, um, we could read people and not say, oh, they're pro-capitalist, they're liberal, you know, like we, we need to learn from a variety of people. I happen to really like to read a lot of quote unquote, literary magazines, journals. And I feel like I learn a lot from reading the New Yorker or the London Review of Books and the New York Review of Books, just to keep up with cultural discussion. Because what I do is I'm a Marxist cultural critic. I'm a Marxist cultural theorist. So it's what you want to know about, what you're trying to figure out, is what I would say to students, to comrades, to friends, to family. Read people who are respected in your, I mean, it sounds kind of cliche, but read people who are respected in your traditions. And, you know, I, I think, I, I guess you would call Stephen Jay Gould a Marxist, but I, aside from Marx, there's probably no other writer who's ever lived that I've learned more from. And I'll leave it at that. Okay, great. And we're, uh, oh. we're heading to the uh, two hour mark. So uh, if Jules and Izzy have got, got something specifically to that question, uh, then by all means, and then maybe we can segue into any uh, closing remarks that the panelists would like to uh, 
make and then we're uh yeah we're gonna we're gonna wrap up so jules yeah yeah i don't have anyone alive but if you're gonna read some dead people probably um simone de beauvoir's second sex uh cedric robinson's black marxism and christopher chitty's sexual hegemony those are my three top tips for understanding stuff to extend beyond marx's own writings Cool. Um, is there anybody who sort of has any kind of uh, sort of burning burning points and closing remarks? Any sort of small small kind of things they'd like to finish on and like sort of slight thoughts or or um, wrappings up? Um, I'd like to just close by saying I'm sorry, Erin. Were you about to say something? Okay. No, um, I just wanted to thank all the panelists. And I thought that, you know, the points that you made around sort of like um, critique and rhetoric, I think are, um, I think the opening sort of call for historical materialism was to think about um, surviving a pandemic and thinking about Marx today. And I think that, um, you know, through your answers, I can really sort of think through different ways that we can use um, Marx's critical edge to just think about this moment. So I wanted to uh, make sure I had like a last thank you for our panelists today. Uh, I also would like to thank people if that's okay. Um, I'm really grateful for this. If you would like more um, continuous Marxological nerding and other kind of topics and, and social theory and Marxism, feel free to join the Facebook group Leftovers. You can find it on there. I suppose I should probably also plug the book out next year again, Transgender Marxism. So that's kind of gonna explore, um, explore some similar stuff. And I'm really grateful for for having been part of this. I, I had a great, uh, a great, very enjoyable time. And um, thanks, thanks to everyone for watching as well. Aaron, Jordi. Um, okay. Uh, like the one line tag for my talk is um, if if you make an origin story characteristic of contemporary contemporary contemporaneous contemporaneous ongoing like social relations then you actually lose track of the specificity of your social relations um so don't do that um and uh you know, my book's coming out in 10 days with pluto press as well on social reproduction theory i'm given a kind of social reproduction account of primitive accumulation and that was minimally plausible to you check out the book i've read it it's great it's a very good book i I'll, I guess I'll jump in with a, a closing um, statement, which is I, I feel like this, even though that we're all doing this in the context of COVID, I, thanks to everyone, thanks to Jules and all the founders of the Leftovers group, um, this has been so rewarding for me and for all of us over the years. And more broadly, thanks to Paul and uh, everyone else at HM for really putting this on um, in spite of, in spite of this fucked up, global situation in which you know where i am the second wave is really bad the second wave is starting to hit new york as i understand it right now though some of you are there like god you know god god anyway um so just thank you to everyone for um for watching and for you know for us continuing this tradition um continuing what we did last year and the year before and uh Inshallah, next year at SOAS. Next year at SOAS. <laughs> yeah, precisely. I think we can. I think we can all agree that we truly hope that we're gonna manage to see one another next year at SOAS. Uh, I echo all of the thanks of all of the panelists for everyone watching at home, for the people who've supported us, who are running everything behind the scenes, and just to again thank the panelists for these wonderful. Papers and I think this thing that Jordi said in his paper, this this recentering marks through decentering marks and decentering marks through recentering marks, this kind of heterodox approach to these classical texts that manages to make them relevant for current sort of debates and political interventions is just something that sort of fills me with uh, with enthusiasm and and energy for the coming political struggles. So just thank you. Everybody, um, uh, just a couple of uh, announcements. The panel tonight is cancelled for anybody who was planning to watch that from the sort of people still watching at home.
Um, and yeah, don't forget to subscribe to Historical Materialism Journal. <laughs> but with that, we will close the panel. Um, and thank you very much, everybody. It's wonderful. Bye.